my organization. Uh, that one? No, no, no. Oh, okay, so yeah. I'll, I'll do an introduction. Right. But we're the Internet Numbers Registry for the Asia Pacific region. Oh, okay. My IP address. Oh, yeah. There is, yeah. And uh, the, the connectivity <laughs> for the providers. So in Singapore, right. with the different mobile operators, huh? uh, ISPs. Oh. Uh, oui. Hello, okay. So we will begin our workshop immediately. Please uh, sit it, okay? All right, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I saw the announcement. Europe has run out of IPv4. It's quite a, quite a thing. The price just went up very sharply, I think. Okay, all right. So good morning. Thank you for attending our workshop this morning. I think the time is early. And my name is Li Yuxiao. I'm the Secretary General of the Cyberspace, uh, Cyber Security Association of China. Uh, this morning, I'm the host and happy to welcome you to participate in our workshop. And uh, this workshop today is about the different parties' rules in the personal information protection practices and attempts in the view of uh, Asia-Pacific region. Since we are all concerned about this issue, um, okay, thank you. We're honored to create this panel to, I think, uh, this, uh, uh, this two points. Firstly, effectively publicize, uh, oh, yeah, just begin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. for, is it just being okay? So, firstly, uh, for we created this panel is to effectively public, uh, publicize the, the measure and the practice of personal information protection in the Asia Pacific region, and the secondly, enhance. Participants many understanding of the role that a different subject can play in the personal information protection. Uh, right now, uh, let me introduce about our fantastic guest here, and uh, they are Professor Wolfgang uh, Kelly Watchers. Wolfgang is enough. <laughs> Work is enough. Okay, uh, we know him uh, very well. Yeah, he's so uh, famous in this uh, in the governance area, uh, and uh, I think that it's very uh, important to hear about his idea in this area. And uh, also, uh, I want to introduce uh, the CEO of uh, Epinic Foundation, uh, Mr. Duncan McIntyre. You're welcome. And. Uh, Mr. Henry Gao, uh, associate, uh, pro uh, associate pro Professor of Law, Singapore Management uh, University. Oh. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Hong Yanqing, Senior Researcher at Law and the Development Economy at Peking University. You're welcome. And uh, another uh, speaker is uh, uh, Aija Data, he's a uh, founder and the CEO of Data Sagan Technologies, who is now joining us remotely. And uh, another one, I think, is uh, Professor Joanne, and uh, he's uh, executive director of uh, Diploma, uh, Diplo Foundation, and uh, he's also the secretary of the UN high-level panel of um, digital cooperation. I think uh, later he will join us. And, uh, so the, uh, I think that uh, uh, since we talk about the personal information protection, this is a very serious problem or questions for us. Uh, when we face a lot of new technologies and uh, new policies uh, appeared in all the world, and uh, we must think about what's the basic principle for protect the personal information. And then, uh, first, I want to share some ideas with you and uh, uh, introduce about our association's uh, uh, activities in the past uh, few, few times. Uh, right now, I'm the uh, Secretary General of the Cybersecurity Association of China, and uh, uh, we call it uh, uh, CSAC, uh, CSIC. It's the first nationwide no profit uh, social organization in the field of cybersecurity. Cyber 
which is founded in 1916. Uh, so far, we have 280 uh, unit members and uh, 300 individual members, including Chinese, uh, Chinese leading IT enterprises and uh, cybersecurity enterprises, universities, research institute, and the industry expert. The protection of personal information, I think that is, uh, has always been an important issue of concern to our association. And uh, our member has been actively promoting the protection of personal information of China. This effort is not only directed to relevant government department and the legislative branches, but also to the general public. In 2019, China launched a special government, uh, governance actions against the mobile APPs, which collect and use uh, personal information in relation of laws and uh, regulation. Uh, and I, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Hong will introduce it later. And uh, our, yeah, our association has deeply involved in this APP actions, and we have achieved very good results. Since its establishment, our as association has also been carrying out an activity called Cyber Security Tour in China, which aims to reach the public awareness of information protection in various provinces on uh, all across of China. And um, since we talk about the personal information, I think that it's a really complex issue, especially engaging uh, emerging technologies such as uh, AI, 5G, IoT, and the big data has uh, continuously promoted various information services and turned on all connected users into consumers who has highly rely on internet services. In the past time, many service, uh, services provider have the uh, formulations on, uh, of data technology and the internet rules, but lack effective governance mechanism, especially the monitoring and the responsibility de uh, determination mechanism. Publish, uh, policy, uh, the public pol policy makers and the regulators lack effective tools to implement personal information protection and the ability to judge the possible risk that the information service posed to the personal information protection. As well as facing huge pursuit from the public, they are consensus but still not convention in the international community in the absence of the mechanism for the international, Professor Yorka, mm -hmm. the institutional difference between countries have became, uh, become the third sort for the cross-bounder data flow of grossly enterprises, services, and uh, personal data flows globally. However, separation and laws has national boundaries. What we are facing is uh, structure issues, in fact, which not only require time, but also the participate of all parties. Moreover, civil society should take on more roles. So in this regard, I would like to uh, make some following su suggestion. Uh, I think that is uh, the three. Firstly, in the absence of the global personal information protection rules, each party should clearly define its responsibility in the protection process. We see more and more countries are formulating corresponding laws to protect the legislative rate and the interest of users. And the, the, uh, in EU, the GDPR is a typical case, but it only protects the right of EU citizens and um, you know, take efforts to the EU's benefit. But also for the Asia-Pacific user cannot be fully protected. Under one world, one night, do all the internet users have some of the same rights? Does it include the right to protect uh, personal information? Are there no responsibility and the lack of uh, protections because of regional difference? Obviously, the necessary communication channels need to be established between the government, enterprises, and the community to solve this problem. I think it's the first. And secondly, Compare with the EU, US, and other regions where uh, uh, personal information protection has been 
practiced earlier, Asia Pacific can do much more in terms of uh, personal information protection in the future. We created this workshop arm to discuss this topic in deep. And uh, we also hope to promote the improvement of the uh, parental information protection in Asia and the Asia Pacific regions. Think of facing the 4.2 billion people and the 2.27 billion internet users in Asia. We are realizing the huge difference and the difficulties. Cyber society, I think, should uh, actually organize and publicize the best practice cases and the experience of personal information protection. Though this, we can jointly improve the level of personal information protection and work for the creating a regional or even global applicable rules on personal information protection. Cyber society in various countries should further stringent communication and the mutual recognition mechanism for the protection of personal information can be established between countries. Countries, Perhaps the, the Asia-Pacific countries can take the first steps to protect the cyber securities of Asia Pacific, uh, perfect uh, regions and avoid extensive internet fragmentations. Uh, Europe has always been at the forefront in this field and uh, other areas also. And uh, I think that it's worth it for our, our more research and study for the Asia uh, uh, countries. And the last, the, the thirdly, but not uh, maybe uh, uh, there's uh, something more, the, not the least. Uh, the legal protection of personal information should be became, become the basic right of every citizen. And the protection of people's information to consumer should become the basic responsibility of service provider. Civil society should serve as an important platform on the other, uh, one hand, we should increase the input to formulate uh, standards for personal information protection in the industry and to restrict it to the collection, use, transmission of personal information through internet, uh, industry self-regulation. On the other hand, civil society can encourage members, company to develop personal inf uh, information protection tools and uh, provide services to protect personal uh, information uh, usefully. For example, our members include many leading cybersecurity companies as uh, guardians of the internet. They have natural advantages and uh, well responding the, uh, to traditional cybersecurity problems. They can through uh, seat per, uh, uh, treat uh, per, uh, Personal information protection as a very permitting market. So, at the level of personal information protection, I suggest that the exchange in the Asia Pacific regions should be richer and more effective. And the exchanges between civil society and the communities in various countries should be more active and in deep. Meanwhile, we also will welcome companies, research institutions, and experts from all over the country and uh, to uh, conduct a dialogue with us and provide valuable policy suggestion to governments and the information, uh, international communities. We also hope that the local governments will fully consider the reasonable claim of our members' company and the internet users and give them the necessary protection. So this uh, I want to share to you all, and uh, thank you. And uh, later, I, I want to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Duke Merchant to give us a, a, a few words. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me begin by thanking the Cybersecurity Association of China and congratulating Li Yuzhao and his team for putting this workshop together. I'm very pleased to be here on behalf of APNIC. For those of you who are looking for Paul Wilson, the Director General of APNIC, Paul's uh, uh, had to stay in Australia because of the bushfire <coughs> situation there uh, around his home. Uh, so I'm here as the CEO of the APNIC Foundation, um, which is closely affiliated uh, to APNIC, and we work together very closely. So we're very pleased to have this chance to join this panel. And I'm going to give you uh, 
a, a specific example of the challenge of managing personal information. Um, but before I do that, I'll step back um, and introduce uh, APNIC. Um, for those of you in the audience who don't know APNIC, it, it's the Asia Pacific Network Information Centre. Um, it's one of five regional internet registries around the world responsible for managing and distributing IP addresses, internet protocol addresses, um, the fundamental number or point of connectivity in your device. If you go to settings, everyone in this room, take your phone, go to settings, you'll find the IP address that your provider has provided dynamically on a daily basis when you log on. And that address provides the point of connectivity for your device on a daily basis. And that address is provided by one of the five regional internet registries here in Europe. Uh, it's uh, RIPE, it, which is based in Amsterdam. We obviously are APNIC in Asia Pacific. There's a LACNIC for Latin America, an AFRINIC for Africa, etc., for the regions. And the model of operation for the internet numbers registries is a non-profit uh, membership organization. So APNIC as an organization is actually a secretariat serving a membership. And, and the way it, it works is as a mobile phone operator or an internet service provider or a data center requires um, internet um, IP addresses or AS numbers, the address resources needed for connectivity in their networks, they will come to us, to APNIC, and, and request uh, a supply of number resources. We provide those, and in that process, that network provider becomes our member. Um, in the Asia Pacific region, we have around 16,000 uh, network operators as members. Um, these are divided into direct members, direct members to APNIC, or indirect members, as in the case in China, where there is a national numbers registry, CNIC, mm -hmm. um, that, that provides this uh, number resource services to all the network operators um, in China, and there are several other national registries around the region. Um, we're not a large organization, we're about 80 staff managing this particularly fundamental piece of the internet infrastructure at the very foundation, if you like. Um, but the, the management of the addresses is, of course, a fairly large exercise because there's billions, literally, of addresses. Um, for those of you who follow the registries, you'll know that um, in Europe this week, they actually ran out of IPv4 addresses uh, in quite a big announcement, but that's another conversation I can have with people separately. The responsibility of managing the addresses is really the really key aspect of APNIC's operations. Um, and when we distribute or allocate or provide address resources to a network operator in each economy, and in our region we have 56 economies, so they include obviously China and India, very large economies with some of the, well, not some of, the largest mobile phone operators in the world in the case of China, um, down to the smallest ISPs uh, in the Pacific Islands, for example, in places like Vanuatu or Tuvalu where the ISP is servicing 8,000 people. But in each of those 56 economies, which is from Afghanistan to the Pacific, we have this responsibility to provide these addresses but then to always be able to identify who is managing those addresses. And this is the key bit about personal information. Because what happens is if I'm a network operator in, for example, Indonesia, and I may have a issue or a concern with another network, because obviously everybody's network is very closely integrated and connected. That's how the, net the internet is. It's a network of networks. So it's very important that each network, as it connects with another network, has a point of contact in that other network. So if there's a cyber security incident or any other issue or a peering request, um, one network is able to contact another network. And this is where we get into personal information. So it's our responsibility at APNIC as the regional internet registry to run a database of, that provides this information. And we call this database the Who Is. Mm -hmm. And the Who Is is a publicly searchable database detailing address usage within the Asia Pacific region. 
Anyone can go on and search through who he is. The results are provided purely for operational purposes. We, we very tightly control it around it can't be used for commercial purposes or anything like that. But it's very important that it's the authority place you can go to to find the contact, the technical contact for a network that's operating in your economy or your region or anywhere around that. And so as we allocate resources to those 16,000 different networks, we work very hard with each of the members to make sure that personal information is up to date and is available. And as I say, it's a publicly accessible and searchable database. So when GDPR came along a few years ago, even though we do not operate within the European Union jurisdiction, it was very important for us to be able to look at the publicly available information on each individual who is the corporate contact and make sure that we fulfill the requirements of GDPR when we were aware of it. And I think that's really the key message that we have, that in the process of ensuring the privacy of individuals and their information on the internet, you have an example here of it's fundamentally important that that information is available for other people. If it's not available and I can't contact another network, that's a major technical challenge. So we've got to be able to provide the safeguards that the chair talked about in, in his opening remarks around personal information, but at the same time not restrict the efficient and secure operation of the internet by blocking contacts between network operators. And that's, that's frankly is a big challenge because it's not just GDPR, of course. As we move forward and each economy in the Asia Pacific region now is developing their own privacy legislation and each jurisdiction, all 56 over the next few years, we can see moving towards their own uh, national priorities in terms of privacy uh, protection for the individual and privacy regulation. And the case that we bring to each of these economies and each of these discussions and why I think this forum is particularly useful today um, is that there must be recognition that there are communities where access to information on an individual is very important for its operation. And the challenge is how do we uh, ensure the effective implementation of good legislation to protect a person's privacy, but at the same time allow for the efficient operation of something as fundamental as the internet itself. Because we do require in the who is this, this need for one network operator to contact another network operator. Um, and as I say, you, you lay over the GDPR and then the national legislations and it can become increasingly complex. And we frankly don't have an answer, but we do find it very important that we have a voice that the technical community that we represent, the network operators, can come to forums like this and have this discussion and say, um, yes, we understand your priorities in terms of managing personal information and the need to protect it, but we also want you to understand the needs of the technical community in how it wants to operate the internet. So I'll stop there. Um, I look forward to the other discussions and presentations and any questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Token. Uh, and uh, Majin, today you share us a lot of uh, who is uh, uh, information, and uh, also I think that's uh, very important to uh, make it effective to protect the uh, personal information. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, now I, I want to ask uh, Professor Gao, uh, I want to change your, your speech uh, later and ask uh, uh, Wolfgang, Professor, because he, he will give Okay, so Wolfgang, okay. yours. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you also for the invitation. And I think the Cybersecurity Association in China is a big player on the global scale. Uh, however, uh, the understanding of cybersecurity has changed over the years. Uh, 20 years ago, cybersecurity was seen mainly as a technical issue, you know, how to um, make the uh, devices and the networks secure. 
And then the understanding of cybersecurity has changed over the years, you know, with the spread of the internet. And as it was mentioned in the opening speech, now more than 4 billion people are using the internet and 800 million people in China. And this raises uh, another category of cybersecurity issues. You know, uh, my understanding is that you have three big uh, areas for where cybersecurity plays a role. Uh, the first one is now a question of national security. So, and you know, for whatever reason, uh, the sad reality is now that we see the militarization of cyberspace. Uh, the internet uh, and cyberspace is a question now also of war and peace. So uh, there is no definition what a cyber war is. There is no definition what cyber weapons are. But we have seen in the last years, year by year, more and more, that there are cyber attacks which undermine the national security of countries. Uh, and uh, this is a big issue. And uh, there are some uh, intergovernmental negotiations, meanwhile, in the United Nations under the first committee. There are two intergovernmental working groups. One is the so-called open-ended working group, and another one is the so-called group of governmental experts, where uh, governments try to find uh, solutions and uh, to define norms for the behavior of states in cyberspace and also confidence building measures and uh, capacity building measures because you know diplomats and uh, other officials very often you know have good skills to negotiate treaties but they do not know the issue and that's a big problem that uh, if negotiator do not understand you know what are the technical uh, dimensions of the issues they negotiate, then you have a problem. That's why capacity building is is an issue. And um, uh, you have also a number of activities uh, on the regional level. For instance, the ASEAN countries, the ministers for communication have adopted a number of norms and confidence building measure how to enhance uh, international security in the region, and you have a number of, um, uh, let's say, private sector and multi-stakeholder activities. Uh, Microsoft was very active in the last couple of years, and they have uh, produced a document called the Tech Accord, which defines some norms for the behavior also of non-state actors. And the Siemens Corporation here in Germany has also created a platform which is called the uh, Charter of Trust, which gives you some guidelines, you know, how to uh, make the cyberspace a more secure place. And I myself, I was a member of a, com a global commission on stability in cyberspace. And just uh, 10 days ago at the Paris Peace Forum, we uh, presented our final report where we have proposed eight norms for state and non-state actors. Because, you know, the conclusion of this commission, which was chaired by former politicians, the was the foreign minister from Estonia, Madame Kaljuran, the uh, former secretary of the uh, Homeland Security from the United States, Michael Chertoff, and the national security advisor for India, Lada Reddy, these were the three chairpersons. And, you know, this former politician said, okay, we have to go beyond traditional negotiations in the UN context. We have to include non-state actors. And we have also to go beyond the 30 and 11 principles which were already adopted by the group of governmental experts in the year 2015. And we have to be more specific if it comes to, for instance, the public core of the internet. And what we have seen, unfortunately, and uh, you know, the ethnic knows certainly a lot of these cases, so that there are growing attacks against the core elements of the internet, against the domain name system, against IP address system, against routing, against servers, root servers. And this is a danger that means uh, I see it really as a, as a very risky development because the world is the 
dependent now from the internet. And if it doesn't function, if you hijack a domain and send emails in different directions or you want to go to a website and it's not uh, reachable anymore because you know somebody has confused or uh, blocked uh, servers. So this is very dangerous and there should be an international arrangement to protect the public core of the internet and this is the main message uh, from from our report. Uh, there is a second uh, issue with um, cybersecurity and this is more criminal behavior. So I think cybercrime is not new. Uh, we uh, have, uh, it was called in the 1990s computer crime, uh, but then uh, after September 11, uh, you know, the Council of Europe uh, together with the United States said, okay, we need an international treaty on this, and so the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime emerged. So in it, the Budapest Convention defined a number of um, cases, you know, what can be seen as cybercrime, the you know, if you manipulate networks or computers or you know, so-called hacking, you know, this is seen meanwhile as a crime. Uh, the problem with the Budapest Convention was that it was negotiated under a certain pressure to do something after September 11 in the year 2001, and some big countries were not involved in the drafting, like Brazil, India, also China. And in so far, you know, the appetite of these countries to sign and to ratify this convention was rather low because they said, okay, we have not been part of the drafting. Probably we would have for some articles a different idea. Russia doesn't like Article 32 and there are some other things. And in so far, the, the, the uh, Budapest Convention has also only a limited reach. It, it's a universal document, Japan, uh, Australia, New Zealand are partner of it, but you know some big countries like China, Russia, India, and Brazil uh, are not members. So just recently, Ghana, an African country, has signed the con convention, but it's only around 70 uh, member states. So it's it, it's not the 193 member states of the United Nations. This is under discussion in the third committee of the General Assembly for a couple of years, and just recently, last week, uh, the third committee decided uh, to start uh, another intergovernmental uh, working group to consider or to investigate whether it would be good to have a universal instrument which would you know become inspired from the Budapest convention but would got to, would probably go beyond this uh, by including you know all 193 member states so this is the basket of crime. And then we come to the third basket, and this was mainly the, the, the subject of your speech, and this is the personal security if it comes to data protection information. By the way, it was this country, Germany, which introduced the first data protection law already in the year 1970. That means nearly 50 years ago. Uh, and, and this came also, you know, with the distribution of computers, that people, you know, became nervous what happens with my personal data if they are uh, in, in a computer. And, you know, we had a big of a public campaign in the 1970s in Germany, which resulted in the introduction into a new article in the basic law of Germany, in the Constitution, which has uh, established the right of informational self-determination. That means this is a really a fundamental right. And it says, you know, it's the individual who is owner of the right, and not the government, not the corporations. So, and it's the duty of the government to protect this uh, uh, personal information. And you know, at, in 1970 there was no internet. <laughs> and so then uh, over the years it became clear that this is really a fundamental issue. And uh, the, uh, in Europe, as you have also mentioned, was always on the forefront. It was not only Germany, a number of other countries also jumped then in, uh, in the boat. And with the GDPR, we have reached now a rather high level of the protection of 
personal data against the misuse both by corporations and by the governments. So that means it's the protection of the individual. I think this is the key message. And it was, uh, was not the intention, but it's very interesting to see that the GDPR, which is a rather complex mechanism, you know, of a lot of different rules and and, 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 and specifications uh, has now rocked the boat uh, far beyond Europe. So <laughs> as also our colleague from uh, the APNIC said, you know, uh, in Australia, in the US, in Latin America, uh, you know, the GDPR is seen now as a, you know, important instrument. They are checking, you know, which rules are relevant for them. And this has made also clear that uh, we need uh, not only regional instruments, because it's for, for the, the, the GDPR is just for the 28 member states of the European Union, uh, but we need a global instrument. And there is a discussion which has started also in the in the, in the third committee of the General Assembly of the United Nations, and in particular in the Human Rights Council of the United Nations. And there is a special rapporteur, which was, by the way, nominated after the Snowden affair, uh, was a German-Brazilian initiative to establish a special a rapporteur for the uh, protection of uh, personal data, for the uh, protection of privacy in the digital age. This is Professor Katanaki, and who is very active and writes reports, analyzes situation uh, in, in various countries, uh, and he has a number of proposals how to draft a global instrument for data protection and against mass surveillance. So, but uh, the appetite of governments in the Human Rights Council to draft a new international treaty is at the moment not so high because um, there are um, uh, a, a number of, uh, I would say, delicate issues which are also related to uh, content where it's difficult to reach international agreement. You know, and as uh, the speaker has said this morning, uh, you know, uh, if it comes to content, different countries have a different idea what is good, what is bad content, what is illegal content, what is harmful content. Harmful is not illegal, it's bad content. How to deal with bad content? Should it be blocked? Should it be allowed? And, and, and in so far, it's, that's slippery territory and it's difficult to find a global consensus. And probably we have to, 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 to learn also to uh, understand other uh, opinions uh, a little bit better. On the one hand, you know, there's one world, one internet, and if you uh, uh, want to avoid a fragmentation of the internet, so you have to have also a higher level of uh, understanding and tolerance. So that's a complicated issue, and in so far it needs more study, more research, more dialogue, uh, more better understanding, and I hope that this workshop uh, can uh, contribute to this uh, ongoing dialogue. Uh, what I've heard is that um, uh, the, the, the Cybersecurity Association of China is planning another world forum next year. So I think to have more forum like the IGF um, is a good idea. And I personally, you know, uh, I would wish, though, I was pushing that the Germany uh, has, uh, uh, becomes the host for an IGF for a couple of years, and uh, I'm very happy that we have the IGF now here in Berlin, and I would be also happy to have the IGF sooner or later in China. So uh, we were in Africa, we were in Indonesia, we were in Latin America, we had uh, meetings in Greece, in Lithuania, in Azerbaijan, China would be a good host for an IGF, and then we can discuss the issues of cybersecurity and data protection in another exciting environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your goodwill, and uh, I hope so. <laughs> In, in, in the future, I hope so. And uh, uh, now I want to uh, invite uh, Professor Gao to give us a, a, a such speech. Thank you, Chair. So uh, today, uh, I will focus. Uh, yes, I will focus on the uh, different approaches on personal information protection uh, by uh, different countries. 
before we uh, discuss the personal information protection, I think we need to understand, first of all, what are the main interests which are at stake. And uh, I would say that uh, there are three main stakeholders. The first one is business, which focus on the profit. So for business, they would want the information to flow uh, freely so that uh, they can make uh, the most money, they can reach more consumers, and so on. So here, uh, that is why you see that a lot of businesses, especially big digital firms from the US, they will want to have a free flow of information. Uh, they would want to have their own say in the collection, storage, processing, and transfer of personal data. And second, you have the consumer or the users. For the users, the most important thing is the privacy. And they are most concerned with the protection of personal data, uh, avoid possible leakage, and so on. And then last but certainly not least, you have the government. Here, the government has a power. And this power can be used for good purposes like uh, protecting personal information, and it could also be used to control uh, the personal data uh, from the consumers. So uh, in parallel with these uh, three different, uh, uh, the dynamics of the three different interests, that is a profit, privacy, and power, we also have a three different jurisdictions, the US, EU, and China, with each focusing actually on one of them. For the US, the key is the commercial profit of the business firms. That is why the US has made it uh, a crusade to uh, champion the cause of a free flow of information uh, uh, at the international level where you see in all of these uh, free trade agreements the US has signed recently, such as TPP, USMCA, the US has been very aggressive in insisting that it should include provisions guaranteeing free flow of information across the border and also provision of data localization requirements and a false transfer source code. Now, when it comes to privacy, the US uh, does not have a comprehensive privacy protection framework. Instead, it only has a patchwork of laws and regulations. For example, uh, in the uh, video rental sector, so if you rent a video, if you rent, uh, let's say, some X-rated video, you do not want other people to know that you have rented such video. So the US has a law which says the uh, video renters like uh, Blockbuster cannot uh, release this information to third parties without the consent of the consumers. Similarly, uh, in the US, everyone has a credit card, so when you apply for the credit card, they will, will want your credit score, and that is also regarded as very sensitive information. That is why in the US, there's another law which says you, uh, the, uh, the uh, firms which provide such credit scores cannot release such information, again, without the consent. So uh, for the US, the key is really uh, um, the sector-specific protection. So in other words, uh, it is uh, regulated as a consumer's right. Uh, you only have your personal information or privacy protected for this sector if you are a consumer in a sector. If you see, I never rent a video, or I never uh, apply for a credit card, then unfortunately you do not have the right and uh, these two sectors. And in the US, uh, the agency in charge of uh, privacy enforcement is the Federal Trade Commission, uh, which uh, um, enforce, is supposed to enforce all these laws. And then, uh, but uh, the US also heavily relies on, on self-enforcement uh, um, by the firms, uh, rather than aggressive enforcement at the federal level. The EU has a, a really different approach. For the EU, privacy has become the key in the digital age with the uh, introduction of laws such as the GDPR, and uh, that is uh, really, uh, as the previous speakers have mentioned, that is really uh, taking over the whole world. Uh, it's like uh, every country is now considering something uh, similar to the GDPR. So uh, the GDPR is different from the US approach because the GDPR has elevated privacy as a consumer right to a human right, a fundamental human right. And that is really groundbreaking because uh, if you regulate that as consumer right, and as I mentioned earlier, if you are not a consumer in a sector, you do not enjoy such a right. But a fundamental human rights is different so long as you are a human being, you always 
enjoy such a right. So that is uh, uh, a very different approach. Uh, and the EU, by doing this, uh, basically gives every uh, EU citizen and resident this uh, fundamental right. Another feature of the GDPR is the idea of uh, extraterritoriality, because Article 45 of the GDPR requires the countries where the information on to be transferred to have to uh, get uh, recognition as providing adequate levels of uh, personal information protection. And so far, uh, the EU, um, um, until very recently, until uh, February of last year, uh, there was uh, some internal fight within the EU Commission. Because in the EU, you have two different um, uh, uh, D DJs, uh, uh, divisions, D uh, director generals, dealing with uh, trade agreements and uh, uh, privacy protection issues. Trade agreements are negotiated by DG Trade. And privacy protection, that is the GDPR, is uh, regulated by DG Justice. So uh, DG Justice does not want the EU go on and sign all these uh, free trade agreements without adequate protection of uh, uh, the privacy. So uh, they were only able to reach a compromise in February 2018 where they adopted this horizontal language in all future uh, EU agreements, which basically says, first of all, we recognize uh, that uh, there should be free flow of information across the uh, uh, border uh, and so on. But at the same time, we also recognize that the EU's right to regulate on privacy and personal information protection, since like a GDPR, that is non-negotiable. If you want to, sign, uh, want to sign free trade agreement with us, you have to accept the GDPR. And also, most importantly, the EU's right to regulate is not sub subject to investor state arbitration. That means that if you are foreign from, and if you come to EU and now the GDPR is introduced, you might be say, well, uh, uh, this is in violation of the investment agreement. No, you cannot do that because uh, that is uh, exempted from investor state arbitration, making sure that the EU's uh, right to regulate uh, is uh, absolute. Now, last but certainly not least, China. For China, the key is the cyber sovereignty or cyber security. There is uh, a strong emphasis on uh, security because the President Xi has famously said that uh, there is no national security without cyber security. So uh, as we know, uh, China has a different uh, system whereby there's uh, no uh, absolute free flow of information. Instead, uh, uh, some information are filtered. Uh, and China also introduced uh, regulations which requires the uh, local storage of data and also transfer of source code. Now, when it comes to privacy, uh, China did not really introduce any law on privacy until uh, 2009, when in the new tort law, China started to introduce the right of privacy. Actually, a bit ironically, uh, women's privacy was protected ahead of a men's privacy in China because in the 2005 uh, law on women's right protection, uh, women's privacy was explicitly mentioned as a right, but for everyone else, that is the uh, gentleman in the room, uh, they only had their privacy right protected four years later. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the um, cybersecurity law of 2017, uh, there have been some argument as to whether or not the privacy right is so absolute that uh, uh, you can only transfer the personal information uh, with the consent of the subject, that is the uh, person, the underlying person. But I uh, doubt that this is the case because if you uh, look at the, the uh, laws, you can see that there were other provisions in the same law where uh, actually there are extensive exemptions for the government. For example, Article 42 of the same law says uh, the uh, operators can collect and use uh, the personal information subject to, first of all, the mutual agreement with the user, that is the agreement by the user, and second, provisions in the law. So if you look at other laws in China, for example, if you look at the national security law, national security law requires explicitly under both Article 11 and Article 77 for all Chinese uh, nationals and organizations to help uh, 
uh, protect the national security. So if the government says we want to collect this personal information for national security purposes, of course that would be allowed even if the user does not give the consent. Another thing is that Article 42 only says that uh, you cannot transfer personal information to any other person without consent of the subject. It does not say that you cannot transfer any uh, personal information to any other organization or government without a personal concept. So uh, uh, the government, uh, if the government want to collect the personal information, it does not need to get the consent of the subject. So uh, this would uh, basically conclude my presentation, uh, but I find the contracts between three different approaches is uh, very interesting. I'm not saying that uh, there is uh, an absolutely the best approach. Instead, uh, as you can see, these three different approaches uh, reflect the uh, different uh, traditions, different culture, different legal system of uh, different countries. But of course, they would have different consequences. The US, because of all this freedom according to the business firms, led to the uh, 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 prosperity of the sector. Uh, in China, uh, because of the strong emphasis on security, uh, and therefore the government has a major role to play, while in the EU, because of the strong emphasis uh, on the uh, privacy of the users, you could argue that is uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, they do not have many digital firms, especially the big ones, because the GDPR is strictly enforced, actually would make it very hard for firms, especially small and medium-sized firms, to operate. So I think before we uh, start to think which approach to, to take, we have to first of all understand the uh, 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 rationale of the different approaches and the possible implications from each different approach. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. And uh, I think you, your topic is very interesting, and uh, I hope that you can have time to do some research about uh, the recent years uh, China's uh, laws making for the uh, privacy protection and uh, data uh, security management. And I think that uh, not only from the, uh, the national security, but also from the consumer and uh, per per personal information protection that uh, we take a lot of actions, not only really for the legislation, but also for the uh, regulation. And also uh, not only from the GDPR and uh, uh, for the US measures, as, uh, there's uh, a lot of uh, useful uh, sectors, but also there's uh, some limitations also. So we must uh, think that a different kind of magnum must uh, take the suitable uh, framework to make this uh, personal information protection more effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, now I want to invite our uh, uh, remote uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Ajay Data, gave us a speech. Um, He's a founder and a CEO of a, a Data Exagen. And uh, Mr. Ajay, are you here? I'm here to speak. I hope you guys can hear me. Uh, I turn it to you. You can make a speech. Okay. Hello? Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you. you can. So uh, I can't hear you. I am Ajay Data sitting right now here in India. And uh, I want to tell you in India, Supreme Court which is the top court of India, has decided privacy as a fundamental right of every citizen of India. That's a big deal because that creates lots of legal framework, lots of liability on the companies, lots of uh, issues which were not there before 2017. This law came in 2017. Actually, I have uh, on a chat box, I have shared the link uh, to, uh, to everyone so that uh, it can be shared and read about it in India, what's happening. Right now, while I'm talking to you, there is a very big issue going on in our parliament. 
which is the top place to discuss the constitution the policies of the country and there is an issue which is being discussed right now about the spying through whatsapp on private data so if you heard the news few days before whatsapp through uh, was hacked and a company which is known as nso group sold a spy software and this got embedded into the whatsapp and it got into high profile people of the country to take away the data what i want to convey here is that the kind of world we are living in right now you do not know what data is going out of your hand who is getting the data in spite of all the law and the framework and everything is in place how do you really deal with that somebody is sitting in a remote country which even you have not even heard of how do you take the remedial effect how do you even know that you are the victim how do you even know that you are uh, into the situation where your data is no more private your pictures are no more private your data itself what is the profile is no more private your phone number is no more private everything is gone how do you really protect that information which is there right now meaning thereby this requires a lot more deeper discussion at every level why i was invited here to speak about little bit about our platform which we use to protect the privacy of the users protect the privacy of their profiles in our email platform we are the probably only company in the world who exchange and implement the permission framework whenever the information is being exchanged in within the email also so the data is encrypted data is protected by the permission framework and whatever is being exchanged between two people is always through the permission not just like that anybody can access anything even the email administrators can access anything it is doesn't happen that way once the data is being given data is being can be accessed even by the email administrator via the permission framework only this is the need of an hour we are sitting where the i am able to talk to all of you from india the technology is allowing to do talks remotely exchange data remotely ex share data whatever you like to the laws may be different in between this country and the other country and that you may be exchanging information knowingly or unknowingly and your data is suddenly public and you, everybody may not be aware about all the small terms and conditions and the check boxes which are ticked on the website while terms and conditions are read and the uh, conditions are agreed up and you have no choice but to repair that problem another problem which uh, we are uh, right now addressing here is how do we really ensure that the data which we say is private is really private not just for the third party even for the person who has a custody who is a custodian of the data so how do you really ensure that my data if it is with the government of india in my aadhar card which is the world's largest identity platform to identify the citizens and we are billion plus people how do you ensure that even my administrator who accesses my data do not really have an access to the data and use it against me or public it make it available to somebody else how do you really ensure that how do we really ensure and bring that framework out that really nobody has an access to the data and this data protection what are the information related to me really really protected really ensured and a secure environment it is not available to the people who may misuse or who may uh, use it Uh, for the time period so i guess i think with a limited time uh, for 3 4 minutes i was given uh, i am uh, able to share what i wanted to share if there are any questions at the end i would be happy to answer thank you very much for the opportunity thank you thank you ajay and uh, you share as very uh, interesting uh, india practice on um, protecting uh, for the information uh, information thank you And now I want to invite uh, Professor uh, Joanne to give us a speech. Professor, you're welcome. Oh. <clears throat> well, uh, I won't say that I can deliver a speech. There, I have two minutes. It will be the shortest presentation which I ever delivered. Uh, but uh, good, good thing is that uh, previous speakers uh, listed the major issues. And I would just like to highlight one aspect which is extremely important for understanding of you 
as a policy makers and academics. Uh, there is digital interdependence in the modern world on the level of society and on international level. This was also the title of the UN High Level Panel where I was Executive Director of the Secretariat. Now, one of the previous speakers made really uh, uh, insightful a survey of US, EU, and Chinese data policies. And uh, if I can summarize in a tweet, US focuses on the economy, EU focuses on the human rights, and Chinese focuses on cybersecurity. Now, what is the real problem and challenge that we face is that you cannot easily separate this in silos. As we know, in February, you had to negotiate trade and human rights internally within the European Union, trade and human rights aspect. What I'm seeing uh, every day in Geneva, where I'm based, is that many countries and the international organization face a problem of dealing with data in silos. You negotiate in trade organization, it is question of free flow of data, e-commerce, where, by the way, both uh, uh, European, all, uh, uh, European Union, China, and US, and Russia are part of plurilateral negotiations. But they focus on free flow of data across national borders. Then you move to Human Rights Council and you have privacy discussion. Then you move to standard, and I'm speaking about three kilometers of the radius. You then move literally physically, you vote, vote uh, to the International Standardization Organization, you discuss standards. Another half kilometer WHO, you discuss data and health. Another half kilometer to the ITU, you discuss telecommunication infrastructure. Now what is the real problem for many countries, and I think I would say all countries, is that they access this through the policy silos. One group is discussing in trade. Literally, you have mission to the, in Geneva to the trade, WTO, and to the UN. The other group goes to human rights. The third group goes to technical discussions. And sometimes I have a small collection on confusing conflicts. Country argues for one position in trade, for the other position in human rights, the third position in the telecommunication infrastructure. It is going to be a huge challenge for governments, for civil society, for businesses to reconcile different aspects of the trade of data policy, economic, human rights, cultural, technical, and, and security. And I would say this is probably in this really the shortest presentation I have ever made. It is probably the core message. Try to think out of the silos. Try to outreach to other communities within your companies, within your governments, international organizations. Try to learn the language of other community because it is the same issue, data, but viewed through different glasses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> professor is an uh, executive director of a diploma foundation. And uh, uh, in my memory, you set up the first uh, UN project for the internet capacity building program. I think yeah. Yeah, that's uh, 50 years ago. Yeah, yes. I lost my hair. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and uh, in fact, I, I had a lot of, lot of things in this program. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, since the time's reason, I must say sorry to Dr. Hong, and uh, maybe we have no time to share your ideas. And uh, uh, I think that uh, in the past uh, several years, there's uh, have some major development in the Asia Pacific region, and uh, with regard of the privacy and the sec uh, security laws, and as the flow of the corresponder information continues to grow, we are expected to see more and more exchange changes uh, um, to privacy laws in the Asia Pacific region. And we hope that uh, this workshop can help us uh, to all achieve the uh, clarity on some questions, and uh, I hope that uh, all the uh, participants uh, from this panel can get you uh, uh, anything you want. And uh, uh, I hope that uh, not only in the, this uh, workshop, but outside, we can continue to discuss about the same things. And thank you for your joining us. Thank you for your participant. Thank you. Okay.